Good evening, and welcome to Gargoyle Manor, the Monster Museum. I am your internet horror host, Bobby Gamonster, uh, and my co-host, Boris the Buzzard, welcoming you to Monster Movie Night. <laughs> That's right, it's time again for our wonderful, wonderful films brought to you from our delicious underground vaults where Boris constantly digs and pecks, pecks and digs, finding you the most precious tidbits of all. Tonight's feature is something very rare, something very rare indeed. It is a film called And the Screaming Starts, starring Mr. Peter Cushing, along with Herbert Lom and Ian Ogilvy. That's just to name a few of the ones that's in this film, my friend. <laughs> in fact, this film is, uh, takes me back to 1795. Such memories I do have, fond memories, especially of skulls and screaming and <laughs> things in the night like to this. Right, Boris? Exactly. Uh, uh, large homes, manor homes, much like our Gargoyle Manor here. Let us get started, shan't we, for this night's feature and the screaming starts. Let us get started to that. <laughs> In my dreams, I go back to the year 1795, to a time when I was happy. I was on my way to be married. I was going to the house in which I was to find my days filled with fear, my nights filled with horror. Headless horsemen, horseless headsmen, everything. Family tree? Oh, yes, they're all here, from the highest to the lowest. Oh, that's a good portrait. Who is he? Uncle Frederick Fen Griffin, said to be by Hogarth. Really? No. When Uncle Frederick came back from the Indies in 1765. Hogarth died in 1764. Oh, after Hogarth. <laughs> Sir Peter Fen Griffin, the fox hunter, Sir Thomas Van Griffin, the witch hunter. Who's he? 
Oh, that's my grandfather, Sir Henry. Sir Henry Fen Griffin. Catherine. My father, Sir Simon. Now, while you admire my ancestors, I'll go and see that your room is ready.
It was all in her imagination. Why that? Apart from the legacies to the servants, which you can copy from the present will, I want my wife to be sole beneficiary of the estate. That is, until we have children, of course. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. Can you see? Catherine, there's nothing there.
Yes. There was a man. He had a red scar like a, like a birthmark, and he was dressed in rags and bits of old leather. Who is he? Do you know who he is? He's a sort of woodsman. Yours? No one's. What's he doing on the estate? Well, he lives here. Ah, Mrs. Luke. Do you know anything about the woodsman who lives in the grounds? I think you'd best ask the master, milady. Do you? No, milady. The servants on the estate come under the bailiff. I'm only responsible for those inside the house. Is he a servant? No. Not exactly. Well, what is he then? What is he? If this needs ironing, I'll give it to your maid. <laughs> Didn't you hear me? Oh, yes. I heard you, mistress. Then why didn't you answer? I have to hear. Nothing says I have to answer. I want to talk to you. I'm listening. Take your hands out of the water. Which one would you like first, mistress? Either. Either. Well, as I am right-handed, how about this one? Is that the one you wanted? Now the other one. You want to see this one? I just said so. Two hands, you see. Eight fingers, two thumbs, back, front, nothing special about them. Who are you? Silas, son of Silas. And what do you do? I'm a woodsman. You have trouble with an elm, an ash, trouble with anything. You sent for me. How long have you lived here? All my life. My father before me. The master's grandfather gave us the land. Grandfather? Henry Fenn Griffith. Tell me about your grandfather. What do you want to know? What sort of a man was he? 
What did he do? I have no idea. He died long before I was born. He farmed the estate. I spoke to the woodsman today. He says Sir Henry gave his family the land. Why did he? I don't know. It all happened a long time ago. Fifty years, at least. On the estate, there's a cottage, a hovel. A woodsman lives there. Silas. You know him? I know of him. He says Sir Henry gave his family the land. That is true. Why? I'm not at liberty to reveal information which has been entrusted to me. You're the family solicitor. You must tell me. I cannot, without first speaking to your husband. I've asked him. He refuses to tell me anything. But I must know. Our marriage, perhaps our very lives, may depend upon it. Return to Pengriff and tell Sir Charles I will come to see him later tonight. If you can help me, I'll be eternally grateful. Do Lady Pengriff into her coach, Peter. I will try. Right out. See if I can find lawyer Maitland. He should have been here two hours ago. I shall be long.
child. Oh, that window. It could be one of two things. A boy or a girl. Congratulations to you both. Going to take her away? Take her away? To have the baby? Certainly not. Have you no fear of what might happen? Every Finn Griffin for the past 300 years has been born here. So will he. He? It'll be a boy. I'm sure of that. An heir to Finn Griffin. Charles, for God's sake, you must tell her. No. Then I will. Will you? No. You believe in it, then? After what happened to Maitland? Maitland was murdered. We don't know why or by whom. But his killer will be found. His killer must be found. Come, come now, Silas. Save time. Tell us why you did it. Who else round here owns a long-handled axe? Every farmer. Every smallholder. But they weren't in Brinkton Wood last night. Nor was I. Morning, Charles. Morning, Sir John. Morning, Sir Charles. Morning. Has he confessed yet? Says he didn't do it. Who else could it be? Wasn't me, Master. My time is coming. You haven't eaten any breakfast. You must eat. I don't want anything. Well, think of the baby. I don't want the baby. Why? You know why. You all know. But no one will tell me. What is it? Please, tell me. I can't. Why? I'm afraid. Afraid? Of what? Afraid of what? I can't tell you, but I'll show you.
Will there be anything else, my lady? The master and Dr. Whittle think she must have fallen. Tripped on the stairs, most likely. Thank you, Bridget. That will be all. I came here as your chaperone at your guardian's request. After your wedding, I decided to stay to protect you. But the time has come for us to go. Go? Yeah, where to? Back to London. Back to civilization. Leave my husband. I've ordered a carriage in the morning. Finish packing your things. Aunt Edith was going to take me away from Fen Griffin. She died of natural causes. Her heart failed her. That's what Dr. Whittle said. Mrs. Luke was going to show me something. Mrs. Luke slipped on the stairs. It was an accident, Kat. Lawyer Maitland was going to persuade you to let him tell me something. What was it? Please tell me. Please. Morning, Master. How much do you want? Want? To get off my land. Why would you want me to go? Your presence disturbs my wife. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. I want you to go. This is my home. Always has been. My ancestral hovel. I'll give you money. Enough to live in London, anywhere you want. I stay here. Why? You know why.
little thing that walks by night in fog or fire, by lake or moorish fen, blue meager hag or stubborn unlaid ghost that breaks his magic chains at curfew time, no goblin nor swart fairy of the mine hath hurtful power o'er true virginity. Screaming well, my friends? I do hope so. Tonight's feature and the screaming starts featuring Mr. Peter Cushing. How much better could anyone want? Really, Boris, do you think? And talking about better, I, I, I wanted to introduce you to one of an item that we have here at the museum. It's a new flask of sorts. It uh, holds a decanter, that's the word, decanter, where we put our spirits and our uh, wineries and soda pop and this type of thing into shaped like a skull as you can see huh it's got a nice little cork in the top and we have one of those oh, three or four of these now sitting on our tables awaiting you our dear dear fiends and friends and uh and uh people who would like to stop in and visit us to uh rejuvenate yourself revive yourself with a nice uh vibation <laughs> libation, libation, right. Get the words quite correct sometimes, right? Exactly. Speaking of words, I do word, love the word scream, and tonight's feature has the word scream in it many times. So let's get back to, and the screaming starts with Mr. Peter Cushing. Get your mind at rest. The baby's quite all right. He just wasn't harmed one little bit. Thank God. And Catherine? Only bruised. I meant her mind. You'll be all right. I brought you a tonic. It'll help you. Uh, 
and the child. There must be something you can do for her. I'm afraid not. These matters are beyond me. But there must be someone who can help her, surely. I know a doctor in London, well versed in a new science. His name is Dr. Pope. It was good of you to come so quickly, Dr. Pope. I expect you're tired and hungry. More curious than tired. Curiosity is necessary in my particular practice. Dr. Whittle mentioned your wife's dreams. Can you elaborate on them at all? No. Do you know of anything that could be troubling her? No, nothing, apart from her pregnancy. That's a normal reaction. Has she been uh, prescribed any medicine? Dr. Whittle has given her a tonic. Hmm. If it contains laudanum, that can produce vivid dreams. I don't think that these dreams are caused by any physic, Doctor. Would you like to see her? I'm afraid she's gone to bed, but I can... Oh, no, no. Don't disturb her. I'll, I'll see her in the morning. Does she know? Why I'm here? Well, she knows you're a doctor, but I haven't told her about your special field of study. Oh, good. Ah, Bridget. Can you show Dr. Pope to his room, please? Yes, sir. Good night, Doctor. Good night. Shall I uh, unpack you, sir? No, thank you. I can manage. Forgive my asking, sir, but are you here about the mistress? I am. You won't be cutting into her, will you, sir? Cutting? Cutting into her body, I mean. Oh, good heavens, no. I'm not a surgeon. It's my belief she's a priest she needs, not a doctor.
You're very young for this position, Philip. Yes, sir. How long have you had such responsibility? Since Mrs. Luke's accident. Oh? What sort of accident? She fell down the stairs. Killed herself. Did she? When was this knife reshot? After the mistress... Slashed the portrait. Dr. Pope. Charles thinks I'm insane. Oh, I'm happy, not insane. Can you cure unhappiness, Doctor? Yes, if I can find the cause. What do you want me to do? Talk. About what? Tell me what is making you unhappy. What about your dreams? Dreams? Yes. Such as the one I understand you had on the night of your wedding. Charles went to his room to change. He left me here. I undressed. I was sitting at the dressing table. I noticed that the window, that one, was open. I closed it. There was a musty smell, and the smell of the graveyard. I got into bed. Suddenly the candles went out. Then a hand was clamped over my mouth. A cold hand. And an arm pinned me to the bed. At the end of the arm, instead of a hand, there was a stump. Severed at the wrist. Covered with blood. You say the candles went out? Yes. Yet you were able to see all this? There was a fire. The logs were burning brightly. Quite so. Quite so. Please go on. Oh, I didn't...
relations with demons. Are there any stories connected with the house of Penn Griffin? Story? Yes, gossip, local legends, superstitions, ghosts. None at all. So there is some. You would not have denied it so vigorously if there wasn't. Tell me about it. I can't. Try. It's too dangerous. I came from London at your request to investigate a case which could be of some interest to those of us who study the science of the mind. Also, to help a lady in great distress. Now, I cannot do so if I am denied the facts, all the facts. You must tell me everything you know. Without your complete confidence, I am powerless. There is a woodsman on the Finn Griffin estate. <laughs> Fine morning for a walk, Dr. Pope. How do you know who I am? Is it the child you've come about? What concern is that of yours? If it dies, I'll kill you. I thought you were lost. Good of you to come out looking for me. Last night, I saw a man outside the window, pillowing rags. Who is he? His name is Silas. He's a woodsman. I found him today in his cottage. He told me that if Lady Fenn Griffin's child dies, he'll kill me. The man's mad. Besides, Dr. Whittle will be attending the delivery. Dr. Whittle is dead. But before he died, he spoke of a legend. Your maid, Bridget, is of the opinion that a priest will be more helpful than a doctor. Your wife is terrified. Isn't it time you told me? Told you what? Whatever it is, you're keeping secret. No. Why not? Because there's nothing to tell. You're a man of science, a doctor. I would never have married Catherine if I thought there was any truth in the story. The legend is mere superstition. If you wish to cure your wife, you will have to disprove that legend. Not to our satisfaction, but to hers. Sit down. The legend dates back to my grandfather, Henry's time, about 50 years ago. He turned this place into a house of debauchery, ignored his wife and son, and filled the place with the scum of the earth.
Sarah, but it's a start. It's lovely. No, it's not. It's too hot in summer, too cold in winter, and too small all the year round. It's ours. That's what counts. <laughs> now, are you going to put me down, Silas? Or are we going to stand around here talking about it all night? Tonight. tonight. Tonight? If we are not too late, that is. Come. It might be worth a ride, to view your bride. She is in bed, master. <laughs> Quite right, too. Where else should she be on her wedding night? <laughs> and what is your name, my dear? Sarah. Have you taken her yet? 
Well, have you? No, Master. Oh. Perhaps you'd like some help. <laughs> no help is needed. He is the master. Aye. The Lord of the Manor has that right. Huh? Those days are long past. An old custom is always worth reviving. <laughs> Especially with a buxom beauty like, um, um, uh, what's her name? No! What did you say? A servant daring to tell his master what he can do? In his own house? With his own wife? Yes. Step aside, we'll forget it ever happened. For the last time, step aside, I say. Get out of my way! Hold him! Get me some wine. Pull him round. So he can watch. An old custom. Silas! No! No! Please! No! no. Must learn respect, Silas. A servant without respect is like an unbroken horse. It must be disciplined. Look out, she's got a knife! him outside. All right. Get some water. Twice today you've raised your hand against me. It shall not happen again. Put his arm on the block. Do you hear me? For mercy. What was that? I can't hear you. <laughs> then take justice.
Ben Griffin. Listen. The evil you did this day will be avenged. I swear a solemn vow. The next virgin ride to come to the house of Pen Griffin will be violated, as was my Sarah. But then shall come the true vengeance on the house of Pen Griffin. And death shall befall anyone who tries to prevent it. What became of them? Silas lived. And Sarah, too, if you can call it living. She had a child, but it died in infancy. And then she changed from a beautiful young girl into a hideous mockery of a woman. Now, Henry changed, too. He tried to make restitution, but Silas would accept nothing. Nothing, that is, until 20 years later, when his own son was born. A son to see the prophecy fulfilled. Silas, son of Silas. Then he accepted for himself and his descendants the perpetual right to live on the Fen Griffin estates free of any payment. And that is why you see the woodsman and their son here, watching and waiting. Malleus Maleficarum, written almost 300 years ago by two Dominican friars. Did you find it interesting? I did. The most sinister classic ever written on the subjects of demonology and witchcraft. It gave rise to the Inquisition and has caused torment and torture beyond reckoning. It's amazing when you consider there is not one scientific fact in nearly 600 pages. You don't think so? I know so. Half the evil in this world is caused by confusing the written word with reality. Or legend with fact? You've heard about this legend, and then in your imagination, 
these things happened. No. These things happened. Then I heard about the legend. It's not the legend that haunts me. It's this. I live in the horror that this is the child of a ghost. Uh, the legend said the next virgin bride. That would have been your mother. No, my mother was a widow when she met my father. Does your wife know that? She might have found out. Doctor, will you stay here till the baby's born? I will stay for as long as you wish. Promise me something. I'll do my best, my dear. What is it? I want to see it first. The baby. Before Charles. And before anyone. Very well. Promise. You must promise. You shall see your baby first. <laughs> Is it a boy? Son. Fine son.
congratulations, master. A son. A proper heir to Fen Griffin. I should have killed you years ago. Them he's dangerous and armed with an axe. So I find him at the graveyard. Has she woken yet?
the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. <laughs> Now, wasn't that a screamtastic film, my friends? Hmm? Left you screaming for more, didn't it? <laughs> I do hope so. I hope you have enjoyed yourselves half as much as we have enjoyed ours, right, Boris? And in fact, we are so enjoyed ourselves, we are so tuckered out. It is getting that time again. I hear the cock crowing in, in the east. That means the sun is coming up. And it's that time for Boris to go to his perch. And I to my coffin, and you to your bed. Because now that the screaming has started, it's only in my head. <laughs> and maybe it's in your head as well. It may be under your bed as well. So I do hope you'll take care. And I do hope that you will come back next time for Monster Movie Night. When we'll have another wonderful Screamtastic episode just for you and you. And you. <laughs> and until that time, keep screaming. <laughs>